Um, is Ken there? Ken Phillips, are you with us? Yes, I'm on the phone, uh, Jason. Oh, great. Thank you, Ken. All right, Ken, I'm, I'm sure you've heard all this before, but just let me get down to it straight away. Um, I call the representatives of Self-Employed Australia. Uh, do you, as a witness appearing before the committee, have any objection to being recorded by media during participation in this hearing? Ken. No. Great. Um, for the hands hard record, could you please state your name and the capacity in which you appear before the committee? Uh, Ken Phillips. I'm the Executive Director of Self-Employed Australia. Ken, these hearings are formal proceedings of the Parliament. The giving of false or misleading evidence is a serious matter and may be regarded as a contempt of the Parliament. The evidence given um, today will be recorded by Hansard and attracts parliamentary privilege. I invite you to make a short opening statement. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, I'll, I'll be as quick as I can to cover as much as possible. Uh, very briefly, we go back to, to 2000 with the ATO. We've been on small business committees since then, around about 2014. Um, our uh, commentary about the ATO started to become a, a lot more robust, although so it's still quite polite lately. Um, but we were heavily involved in the um, Four Corners uh, April 2008 and Mongol Bunch of Bastards show on the ATO. Um, we have very significant experience with the ATO's dealings with small business and we've got to say that those experiences are not good. In, in fact, they are rather bad. Um, the, since the Four Corners show in particular, there have been, uh, and, and before, well before, there have been uh, numerous uh, reports from the Inspector General of Taxation, uh, the Small Business Ombudsman and the parliamentary, the parliamentary Reviews, and I've looked at parliamentary reviews on this going back to the 1970s, and there's a consistent pattern of behaviour of uh, reports coming out uh, telling us exactly what's happening with the ATO and, in, in our view and our experience, uh, abuse particularly of the small business sector by the ATO. Uh, where they simply get things uh, very, very wrong. Um, I won't go through sort of trying to prove all of that because uh, we've got to the stage where we've said, well, look, there's just mountains of evidence about the problem here. Uh, where's the solutions? And what I want to do is uh, focus the committee on one central uh, top-end problem uh, from which everything else flows. And it relates to the ATO's powers at law. Uh, one must remember the ATO was established in 1936 and these primary powers have not altered since 1936. Uh, the central power that creates all of the problems um, is when the ATO does an audit and it forms an opinion of a debt that is owed, that opinion becomes a debt at law it is no longer an opinion, it is a debt at law, and that debt is due and payable immediately at law. Not only that, um, when the taxpayer uh, believes that the debt is not correct, the taxpayer must disprove the ATO's position and has to go further. They have to prove the correct position. In other words, we're operating in an environment with the ATO of reverse onus of proof. The ATO, as a consequence of this, can at law and does collect for and during appeals and objections. I, I have to tell the committee that this situation does not exist in either the United States or in the UK. In both the United States and the UK, uh, the tax collection authorities cannot collect tax or cannot collect an alleged debt until that debt has gone through the entire appeals and objections processes, including any court appeals processes. In other words, there is a very stark and di distinct difference between the powers of the ATO and the powers of the IRS and the HMRC in the UK, which is the tax collection agency there. What happened is we've been searching around for solutions on this because there's just mountains of descriptions of the problems. Uh, in the middle of last year, July 2019, what came across our desk was an alerting to a law in the U US that was just passed by Congress and signed, signed in by the President called the Taxpayer First Act. We had a look at this and it was an extraordinary piece of legislation. Couldn't believe what it was and we said, well, look, there's something going on. 
we went around and decided that really I needed to get to Washington. Uh, we raised some money and I spent two weeks in Washington in October of 2019 doing a research project into the uh, laws covering the administration of the IRS. Uh, when I got over there and uh, met with people, I was told, oh, no, 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 it's not what we've done in July 2019 that was important, but what we have done, what we did in 1998. And what unfolded from there for me was a gobsmacking revelation of the reforms to the IRS in 1998. Um, I met with uh, people who were on the Congressional Review of the IRS in 1997, which led to the 1998 Act. Uh, I, I met with uh, the principal draftsperson of the 1998 Act. I met with the uh, senior people from the, in, uh, the taxpayer advocate in the United States. I met with uh, congressional staffers. Uh, who are involved in the primary committee that oversees the IRS in the United States. I met with lawyers, tax accountants, so on and so forth. And um, in the United States, what they brought in in 1998 was what they call the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. It is a legislated bill of rights. Uh, it has about 10 items to it. One of those items, for example, says that a taxpayer is entitled to finality um, and backing up those Bill of Rights are 71 legislated provisions that describe exactly what the IRS is able to do and not do in terms of the administration, collection of tax and so forth. So, for example, one of those items says that the IRS cannot charge interest on a tax debt that is higher than that that the government itself pays. In Australia, by comparison, the ATO charges... My, from recollection, it is 7% more uh, in interest than the government itself pays in interest. The uh, IRS cannot collect tax uh, until, or collect on a debt until all objections and appeals have been completed, including uh, objections and appeals to a dedicated tax appeals court. The IRS has the onus of proof, uh, and there are all sorts of uh, multiple checks and balances running through the system, they have a very powerful taxpayer advocate, the equivalent of our IGT, but over there, their taxpayer advocate has 1,600 staff. Uh, in 2006, they brought in some very significant whistleblower laws, which enhanced the capacity of the IRS to collect money. Um, essentially, anyone who blows the whistle on a bad taxpayer is entitled to receive a percentage of the revenue raised. Uh, then came the Taxpayer First Act 2019, which has gone further again. And so uh, two weeks I discovered all of this and then uh, I have written a, sorry about this, a 50-page report, uh, which compares the situation in the US to the situation here. And uh, what we're saying to the committee is that this is a, a, a situation in the US that forms a template for the sorts of reforms that we should do and need to do here in Australia with the ATO. Uh, not everything is directly transferable across. Of course, there are different situations, there are different tax laws, there are different cultures, there are different institutions. But in terms of a template, this is an extraordinary situation and we have uh, attempted to explain that clearly to give some sort of pathway through. The... Um, if I can, so I've got that sitting there and we are very keen to, to share it and uh, we believe that t the time is absolutely necessary for us to move from descriptions of the problems with the ATO to solutions with the problems with the ATO and uh, those solutions need to be legislated, uh, not a situation where we leave it to the ATO to do their own reform themselves. If I can, so I come back once again and I'll do some updates for today, today's situation. And remembering what we're saying is the big ticket item here, which is the problem, is that when the ATO does an audit, forms an opinion of a debt, that debt becomes a debt at law, due and payable immediately, and so forth. And we now have in place since last year the, um, uh, the ATO issues a statement of tax record 
this new law and government departments can't use the services of any business that has an adverse statement of tax record. So what we've now got here is that the ATO is the arbitrator and the overseer of who is allowed to have a contract with the government. This has enormous wide-sweeping implications and particularly when you take the, the uh, situation with the powers of the ATO, you can see that if the ATO gets a, uh, an assessment of a, a business's uh, tax situation and gets that assessment wrong and issues an adverse statement of tax record, the ATO is able to absolutely prevent on their, on their own assessment uh, uh, the ability of someone to do uh, a business with government. We now have director identification numbers. These are controlled by the ATO. And again, what we've got a situation where if the ATO decides to take away your uh, director ident identification number, whether they are right or wrong or the facts are correct or not, uh, you're in significant trouble and basically that's the end of your capacity to be in business. The, if I can then turn to uh, what's happening with the COVID situation and uh, on the 23rd of June, just a few days ago, the ATO issued a, a warning uh, to people uh, entitled ATO zeroes in on COVID-19 fraud and have announced a very robust program of chasing fraud. The problem with this is that, of course, once again, we come back to if the ATO uh, does an audit and they believe and they form the opinion that um, you have committed fraud, that is effectively the end of the case. They are the sole arbitrator. I'm predicting here a blow up of enormous proportions that is going to cause mayhem through particularly the small business community in this respect. And I'll give you three quick examples which I can explain in more detail should you be interested. They have announced, the ATO have announced this release that they are going after people on the early release of super where they then make co-contributions. There was nothing in the law that said that if you'd had an early release of superannuation that you couldn't make a contribution, an additional contribution to superannuation. The ATO has now turned around and said, aha, this could be captured under the anti-avoidance mechanisms. And once again, this will be at the whim. Um, we wrote to the Treasurer on the 1st of April saying that there was a significant problem in the design of the cash flow boost with troll sole traders, the workers PTYs, the cash flow boost is clearly intended under the legislation for the uh, cash flow boost to, be, to go to businesses where they have, what let me call it, arm's length employees. Uh, well, we said that there's a problem here because the cash flow boost is going to go to uh, sole traders who run a PTY where the sole trader may be the only employee. And uh, we can confirm that that has happened across the board. Uh, people who are sole traders are getting this thing, and we think that the ATO will wind up doing audits of that. And the uh, one of the other areas, they've listed a number of areas, but the job keeping, they've said they'll be taking job keep away for uh, people who manipulate the turnover. Uh, we are predicting that there would be, that there is going to be considerable, considerable strife in this area with the ATO's audits, coming back to the fact that the ATO does an audit, forms an opinion of a debt, and the the opinion becomes a tax debt at law. I didn't expect to receive an example so quickly of exactly what's going on. I thought it would take some months. But on the 24th of June, I was alerted uh, to a situation with a company with 21 employees. They had applied for and received JobKeeper. They, uh, the basis of the application was on, on the basis of their March turnover of nine, 2019 compared to 2020, a drop 47 per cent. If you remember under the JobKeeper, once your turnover has dropped, you are entitled, no matter what the situation, for the rest of the uh, five or five or six months. However, on the 24th of June, uh, they had their JobKeeper cancelled on the basis that the ATO said that their April comparison 19, 2019 to 2020 had dropped 15 per cent, and so therefore uh, they withdrew the JobKeeper. The uh, the company have sent me all of the records and the correspondence with the ATO. I have read it. I could not believe what I was reading. The cancellation of their JobKeeper payment 
uh, doesn't even reference the March turnover. Uh, Ken, so that's the end of my introduction. Yeah, we, we kind of went a long way over five minutes, and um, and uh, so we'll, um, Stephanie, is it all right if I extend the hearing by fifteen? Do I need a formal motion to that effect? No. Or? Um, so we, we're going to allow for 15 minutes worth of questions. I think, Bert, you indicated you had a question. Is that right? Me. Oh, Sorry, Sorry, I was, Sorry. I was on, on, on mute. No, I didn't have a question. I was just making a comment that um, I thought uh, ASIC were managing the director identification numbers as part of the modern idea, modern modernising business registers program. So um, I'm sure the ATO has got their finger in the pie somewhere as usual, but um, um, I thought that was primarily ASIC's responsibility. That's also just a comment. Okay. Um, I think in answer to that, Bert, um, we handed over all of the registries of which there are 33 to the ATO um, for a modernisation program. And it doesn't seem to me that very much is happening. And as you and I have heard in corporations and financial services, um, ASIC doesn't view it as their job to do anything. So it's, it's um, yeah, anyway. Terry, you have a question. Okay, yeah. Uh, thanks for your time. We'll have a separate discussion about that offline. Thank you, Bert. Sorry, Terry. Well, this is um, dear to my heart as a small business owner for the last 20 years. So uh, I've been a a victim, sorry, a client of the tax department for, for 20 years as a small business owner. And I, I agree with the comments, like the, 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 the scope that they have is unbelievable. And quite often when people have a, a tax debt, they're already in a lot of trouble. And to give them the burden of, of a cost of an audit, uh, a lot of accountants now are charging audit insurance. So you pay this extra $500 or $1,000 a year, which is another cost to your business in case the ATO may do it. So you might be in business for 20 years, pay 20 grand in insurance fees and never get an audit, which is 20 grand that could be reinvested into your business and staff or equipment or whatever. And I'm with this, I think that there actually needs to be, um, it needs to be funded by the ATO. If they come and do an audit, I think that they should be paying the cost of your accountancy fees uh, to do that audit. And I also agree that you should be innocent until proven guilty because that's really what we do in this country in every other aspect. Uh, so to be having a penalty put on you and accruing interest while you're going through that and adding that burden. We, we talk about men mental health a lot. Well, the mental health and the stress it puts on people is totally unfair. I do have a question about the, uh, the record. I haven't heard of that adverse tax record and saying that you couldn't do government contracts. So that's for a tax debt. Is that what we're saying? Well, I... I'm it's, it's, an ad, it's called an adverse statement of tax record. And I'll have to dig into the legislation to discover precisely the powers around that. But when this was flo first floated under the Black Economy Task Force review, we issued warning signals about it, uh, again, saying, well, look, you know, this all depends upon the integrity of the tax audit system and the collection system. So my, my view would be that if you get an, a, an adverse... Uh, audit from the ATO, you will yeah. receive a statement of an adverse statement of tax record and you are then bound, banned from doing business with government. Look, I, I suppose for me, uh, I don't have a problem with people are, are being tax cheats for a, a layman's term, uh, of them there being a penalty, but I would like to find out, number one, uh, the parameters around that, and two, once they've rectified the issue, whether it be a debt, uh, or whatever, do they then lose that? So they're then able to to trade with the government. So they're, they're, I'm not sure if you know that now, but if not, I'd like you to take it on notice and maybe come back to us with that. Look, look, we, we come back to the, the, the central problem here that the administration of the tax system must adhere to normal principles of, of justice. Uh, it does mm -hmm. not. We, in our view, we, we describe the ATO as having the powers of a dictatorship. Uh, what sure. it says is law and to be able to move against it, it it's very akin to sort of Chinese sort of type situation. Yeah. Uh, when we compare it to the United States where there's a very, very sophisticated yeah. system of checks and balances to ensure that tax justice applies in terms of administration, the difference between Australia and the United States is quite extraordinary. 
Yeah, look, I don't think we're going to get you're going to get any argument from us on that. Yeah. We take that point on board. But like I say, if someone has been proven to have a tax debt and they do have that debt, I personally don't have a problem with them having not being able to deal with the government till they sort that out. Uh, but what oh, I want to know I, is, I have, is that, does that, that stay there forever? Yeah. Or once they've sorted the debt out, are they then able to? And I'm not sure about that. Uh, look, you and I are on the same page. Um, if the if the debt is genuine and the mm -hmm. taxpayer, sure. has, we have no problem with it. It's the process of justice that we're concerned about. Yeah, okay. All right, and just interesting on that, um, uh, I'd love to get that correspondence on the uh, JobKeeper because I'm in the same situation. I qualify for JobKeeper in, in my two businesses and then we haven't been down 30% since April. And, but we have still been getting the JobKeeper payment. So uh, I haven't had the same experience where it's been cancelled at all. I've, I've, I've asked the company if they would be prepared to share uh, the correspondence with the committee and, and subject to them checking with their lawyers and so forth confidentiality, uh, they're more than happy to do that. Uh, and certainly I'd ask them and they'd be, I'm quite sure, happy to do that. Perfect, okay. And just the last thing on the cash boost. I was very interested you said that um, you are concerned that it was targeted towards contractors, I think you said. It was a bit hard, it was a bit scratchy. And um, are you saying that some of them didn't get the, the cash boost? No, I'm, I'm saying that there's a vast number of people, probably uh, it will be in the several hundred thousand, who will have received the cash flow boost who under the legislation should not have received it. Uh, okay. And if, 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 if that's the way it pans out, that's fine. But I, I believe that these people are then going to get audited and we're going to have a whole lot of trouble in this area. Mm, okay, we need to find out about that, Jason, because I thought it was pretty straightforward. Once, once you um, submitted your ass uh, statement, then uh, you received a $10,000 credit minimum uh, on on that. So I don't see how they'd be getting it without without being entitled to it. Let's look into it, Terry. Uh, Matt, yeah. did you finish, Terry? Yes, thank you. Matt, do you have a question? Yeah, just a couple of quick ones. Thanks, Jason. Um, Ken... Just curious to know what um, small businesses' um, uh, views are on the expediency of the ATO in dealing with some of these matters, particularly at the moment um, with COVID-19. Uh, I suspect that a lot of businesses are struggling and if you are in a dispute with the tax office, you want that resolved as quickly as possible so you've got a bit of certainty. So what's the experience with how quickly they're dealing with some of those issues? The ATO did a survey uh, an independent survey uh, in 2017 of uh, people who had, had tax debts and objections with the ATO. I think they surveyed somewhere in the order of about 700 people. Uh, the um, uh, results of those surveys were not good for the ATO in our view. Uh, and 61% of people said that the process was too long, too expensive and confusing. Has that changed during COVID-19, do you think? I'm, I'm not aware of the taxation office doing any further uh, audits, uh, sorry, any further surveys of those attitudes since then. <coughs> My, we came out when the ATO made the small error around the uh, calculation of JobKeeper. We actually came out uh, with fulsome praise of the ATO. They did a spectacular job of putting in place the JobKeeper scheme. This thing could have fallen over quite quickly and uh, they had extraordinarily short timelines uh, in which to do this. Um, I deal with a lot of accountants who specialise with small businesses. They are full of praise for the ATO in the setting up and making this move. Our direct dealings with the ATO on this, where we've been putting in queries and so forth on a whole range of things, have been extremely professional, very responsive, and I can't praise them enough. But the minute we start dealing with the audit, and enforcement area of the ATO, we're dealing with the dark forces. To be dramatic about it. Okay, so thanks. So just finally, you mentioned it. People have been dealing. We haven't yet seen the ATO implementing the audit enforcement areas, and this is, in our view, in our experience, where we're going to have very major problems. Okay, thank you. And just finally, you mentioned a 50-page report with some recommendations. Are you able to supply that to the committee? Uh, very keen to do so, please. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Just, just on that, just on that, Chair, Matt. Uh, it's interesting. I've, I've talked to quite a, a lot of the business community in my area, and the feedback has been 
when they rung the ATO during COVID that they have been over the moon with the way they've been treated. Uh, some of them rung up and said, look, I've got this tax debt. It's no problem. You can pay it in October, uh, no penalty. So they've been very good. Uh, and we'd, we'd agree with that. They've been outstanding, absolutely outstanding. Good. Okay, I don't believe there are any other questions. Um, Ken, the one thing that I just wanted to um, get from you in two or three minutes was the Taxpayers' Bill of Rights in the US and the um, Taxpayers' Advocate, I think, inside the IRS. Um, they have That's also um, ended up in uh, quite material reductions in the cost of collecting tax in the US. Is that right? The... Uh the figures that we've been able to put together is that for every $100 of tax collected in the United States, uh, it costs 35 cents. In Australia, for every $100 of tax collected, it costs 96 cents. Uh, so there's a close to three times the cost of collecting tax in Australia in comparison to the IRS. Now, we'll admit that this is not necessarily apples to apples because there may be differences in the uh, remit of both the IRS and the ATO, so the jobs may not be completely different, but it's an extraordinary difference in the cost of collection. But the figures that I've seen seem to indicate that that reduction, that that the scale benefits that the IRS has and the more simple tax system they also have vis-a-vis -vis Australia. Um, so they did have a materially lower cost of collection already of around about 35 to 40 cents in the $100. But that has halved again with the introduction of the uh, Taxpayer Bill of Rights and the um, advent of the, uh, of the Taxpayer Advocate. The... Um Figures that we have are in 1997, the IRS had one staff member for every 2,720 Americans. Uh, by 2019, the IRS had every, uh, one staff member for every 4,150 Americans. They have had what we consider since 1998 in the order of demonstrably a 50% increase in their productivity. We then sought to check whether there had been a reduction in the uh, take, the tax take, uh, on in, in uh, um, consistent dollars. And the stats that we have are that there has been no reduction in. A, in fact, there's just there's been a slight increase in the tax take. So uh, there's been no 50 percent increase in the productivity of the IRS and no reduction in the capacity for, to, uh, to collect tax. One of the big items in that has been, we believe, that the 2006 whistleblower laws in the United States have made a huge difference to the ability of the IRS to collect tax. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, on that note, I'm going to pull up stumps uh, and just say uh, the formal bit, which is, Thank you for coming in today. If you've been asked to provide additional information, which you have been, could you please forward to it to the Secretariat by the 10th of July? Um, if the committee has any further questions, they will send you these in writing through the Secretariat. A transcript of proceedings will be forwarded to you for correction in due course. Um, there were, I think that's it for today, Stephanie, and um, I think that's all I have to say, isn't it? All right. Well, I'll declare this hearing closed and I believe our next hearing is next Friday. Is that right, Stephanie? 16th of July, Thursday. 16th of July. So um, this is becoming a bit of a thing and I look forward to seeing all of you back then. Now, Ken, can I thank you once again for your comprehensive evidence and submission? Quite informative. Thank you.